come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a weekly movie review podcast comes your way every Saturday night, whether you're ready for it or not. We're out to conquer the world and become the fastest growing internet radio movie review podcast that's ever been made. You can help us do that. All you got to do is jump on over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button. Give us a review. All of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you. You like what we're doing here. So, I mean, hey, there's probably somebody else who would like it, too introduce them to the saturday night freak show it's like a cult kind of which may tie into tonight's movie these are the internet radio superstars holly michaela sean and i'm colin and tonight do, uh, do cults have merch like well yeah like, uh, yeah they do usually yeah, they have merch. the next oh, yeah. do the next thing people have merch that's how they make their yeah that's how, that's the economy they sell their uh whatever they pick the well, berries that, that and make their pyramids games and, yeah yeah Scientology is like has a lot of merch. Like they make you buy books and stuff to even like. I'm talking about like a T-shirt that they sell on a website that says Scientology. Yeah, have you seen the Sea Org uniforms? No. <laughs> the Sea Org uniforms. The Sea Org uniforms. Yeah, it's like what the new. It's what like what are you saying? Sea Org. Sea Organization. It's, it's like the, the Scientology Navy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. it's like prison labor navy. Wow, this yeah. is a new one. Right. I'm just looking wow. up Scientology Navy later on. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, we'll save that for later. It's it's not okay, it's not a good thing. It's, it's not pleasant. Yeah. Speaking of merchandise. Michaela, why don't you tell, tell us? Finally someone got the segue. <laughs> a little bit about uh, I heard there was something happened recently with us. We have merch now. You can go to tpublic.com slash user slash Saturday Night Freak Show or check our social media for a link. You can buy t-shirts. You can buy mugs. You can buy pillows. You can buy uh, framed stuff. You can get stickers. Um, there's a lot of options. Baby onesies. Put a baby <laughs> ones on your cat and sh- sh- show us. <laughs> you can wrap yourself and all of the utensils that you use in everyday Wrap yourself life. yourself in a love rhombus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, freak show. Well, we watched a movie tonight that was chosen by. Holly. Holly, what did we watch tonight? Tonight we watched The Village. From the year. From the year. 2004. And directed, directed by. by. <laughs> <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan. Who we would know from? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, well, he's not on the wall of uh, fame yet. Twists. I mean, has he even been on the show before, Colin? Like um, a couple months ago. Dude, seriously, you forgot already, Sean. We literally <laughs> we just watched After Earth. <laughs> oh, that's not a Shyamalan movie. That doesn't count. He is technically the credited director. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, right. I did forget. All right. Well, let me, uh, dear listener, let me give you a warning up front because I know how this gonna is going to go. All his movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, we're probably going to spoil this movie, but we are likely going to spoil every single M night Shyamalan movie. As we talk about the career of the illustrious M night Shyamalan, um, the heir to the, the Rod Serling, the twilight zone. He's been, his mantle has been taken up now by Jordan Peele, who seems to be on a almost similar career trajectory. Um, so, M. Night Shyamalan. Are we going to start there? You just want to start talking about the village or how we got to the village. Whatever works, you know. We should probably start by talking about Shyamalan. I mean. Okay. So uh, the guy had a run that was uh, um, unparalleled, I think, um, for a brief period of time. Not unparalleled, but I mean, he was a success story um for his uh well they weren't even his first movies uh did anybody see i can't remember we we talked about this a little bit on after earth have any of you seen m night Shyamalan's like first and what second movies Uh, because i think the sixth sense was like his third what was the first one and wide awake was the second one seen him i I had to watch uh well when i was in college at that point i had to watch every single one of his movies that were out to that point for school (laughs) so you studied m night Shyamalan. yeah Kind of. Really? What was the, so what was, what class was this, film appreciation or something or? 
Yeah, it was a film studies class. And it was like you had a list of directors you could pick from. And it was a very narrow list. And once you had picked one, you had to like pick another one, but they couldn't be like a similar director, you know? Like the first time I did it, I picked the Coen brothers. And then the second time around, I landed on M. Night Shyamalan because that was like about as far as you can get from Coen brothers. So you had to do like a thesis on M. Night Shyamalan. I had to talk about like his common themes and like what he like who he's inspired by and things like that. Who's he inspired by? Hitchcock mostly. Yeah. That's obvious. That's like his his like hero worship. Has he ever said, have we, do we have any interviews with Charmaine where he just like talks about his appreciation for Hitchcock movies? Yeah, he does that a lot. Oh, he Especially does. on the happening press tour. He talks about that a lot. Okay. Okay. That's I mean, the wrong press tour to be talking about that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I can see it. Well, this is his fourth. We're going to, we're going to, we for the intended purpose of this uh, freak show, we're going to assume that M. Night Shyamalan started making movies with The Sixth Sense in 1999. Yes, yes we are. <laughs> and uh, so this would be the fourth, as far as we're counting them, the fourth Shyamalan movie. Uh, it so what have we by, up to this point? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the Sixth Sense, yeah. and then uh, that was followed by Unbreakable, and that was yep. followed by Signs. Yep. And then came the, ha- uh, sorry, not the happening, the village. Yep. Yes. Um, this is actually something that I was, cause I think I, it's been forever since I saw this movie and I was trying to get back the sense that I had when I first saw it, because it's almost like, you know, it was almost, uh, uh I was saying it during the group chat. Once you know where this movie is going, it almost uh, destroys the movie so you can't watch it a second time uh, yeah. this doesn't happen with other movies with twist endings uh, I have been able to go back and watch those again and still appreciate you know and I'm not going to name some of them but you know you can go back and, and still watch what was going on in the movie and then you're like oh and then there's the twist and blah, blah. but this one specifically it's like the twist colors the entire movie so I think we almost have to talk about the movie that like what the actual story is or, you know, I mean, the, we're assuming, you know, having give the, given these warnings uh, that you listener have, uh, you know, seen this movie, right? So you've already gone through it the one time and you had that experience. Maybe we should talk a little bit about like what our first times were going through uh, um, the village. Sure. The, the village or, <coughs> or Shyamalan. I mean, how did we first uh, experience Shyamalan? Because you... Uh, I'm, I don't know about you guys. I'm not normal. I did not see the sixth sense until way later. After the village. you said. Yeah, I didn't either. I knew what the twist was when I watched it for the first time. Well, that's okay. So did I. And I saw it opening. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What a letdown. Was somebody driving by in the car? Was somebody driving by in a car going, he's dead the whole time. No, I am the Simpsons. No, uh, there was, um, well, it was similar to this movie, actually, uh, because this one also, uh, this is my problem with M. Night Shyamalan movies. Uh, I always seem to be like key to that whole, like, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm in that vibe. I think that way when I think about trying to construct a, a plot and it's always yeah. like, you look at it, like there's a tell that happens and you're like, Oh, Oh, you're doing something here. And then, you know, that's your guess. And you watch the whole movie and it's like, well, the whole movie is bearing this out. And then it's like big reveal. And you're like, Right. You know, but Sixth Sense is still a really good movie. It's got great performances and it has great uh, drama. You know, Um, I think this is one thing that M. Night Shyamalan maybe doesn't get a lot of credit for. I think he's a really good director of actors. um, And I think he writes uh, very good character dramas. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think like, you know, in hindsight, it's like his twists end up coloring the movie. Um, Yeah, but I think like looking back on you know i saw the sixth sense when it came out but and i didn't know the twist and i don't think i'm trying to think of like other movies before that that were like known for a big twist and i think it's just something that i wasn't accustomed to experiencing in a movie it was a big twist at the end so it really did get me like i i didn't watch the movie think oh yeah he's dead i can see it from the start like no like it got me I, it definitely it definitely got me and then um following with signs it was kind of the same thing. Both those movies have a really great creepy aspect. Like if you go and rewatch them, they're still creepy and they're still like you, you get the, 
you know, you get the chills watching them because it still has a creep factor. So it's still rewatchable. Like you said, that the performances are great and it's a great story. Then we get the village and it's completely directed by the twist. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. go and rewatch it and it's like, I'm not creeped out. I'm not. Do you think it's just, I just came and uh, just thought of this that because of the twist in the village, the twist is different from the other ones because yeah. in his previous three movies, uh, the twist is, how do I say this? The things in the movie are real. Like the twist, uh, ghosts are real in that. Yeah. Aliens are real in that. Yeah, um, the hero part is still happening. That's still su- very real. The superheroes and Mr. Glass are still real in that story. What we get in the village is that the twist makes everything fake. Right. And I also think that was, that's a big difference between this twist and the other ones and also why this movie was so divisive. Because it takes away from the movie rather than what the other movies did, I think. I think that's why people were so disappointed with this one. There's also no movie without the twist in the village. You take the twist away, there's no movie there. Like, Oh, I like the romance. Really, is that why you watch this movie? Now it is, yes. But the You're pl- the only the, person. The romance, you are the only person in yeah, the world who does that. Because that's what I was watching, you know, because when, when uh, Holly was saying that, it's like the the relationship drama that's going on, the, the sixth sense is about the kid, and the kid has, you know, he's got uh, something that has to happen to him to change. He's got a character arc, right? And Bruce Willis has a character arc. Bruce Willis's arc is predicated on a twist. But the kid's story right up until the end, like, you know, Bruce Willis helps the kid, you know, uh, acclimate with his power, the end. And then there's a twist after that. Right. Right. The, the village is very different. The village is like the twi- like science the- is about Mel Gibson trying to figure out how to be a single dad. Yeah. And regain his and faith his, and his struggle yeah. with his faith and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. The twist is kind of the, the extra, not the meat. Yeah. Because that it this is one, this movie, it doesn't have like, I know that the, the love story is uh, interesting, but it's like, it's a setup, right. That, even that where it, where it kind of ends and it's like, okay, you know, cause I mean, Joaquin Phoenix is our lead character in this movie and he's ejected from the plot about three quarters of the way through it. And then the last quarter of the movie is, uh, is a completely different, you know, tone and all this other stuff that explains everything that happened prior to this. So it's like the love story never really, I know he thinks that at the very end, you know, it's like, yeah. well, she saves him. <laughs> And that's the right. culmination of the, but it, it, it's, it, the, it's structurally, uh, built on wobbly planks. If he, you know, yes, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> and it's he puts his foot right through it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, up to, up to the point where Joaquin Phoenix gets taken out of the picture. Um, that's the part of the quote unquote, the love story that it ends right there. Once mm-hmm. he's out, Everything after that becomes a tad more monotonous. Yeah. So what we're led to believe, and again, this is uh, one of those deals where, you know, you sit down, you're like, well, I'm in an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and he's all about the twists. And at the very beginning of the movie, you are shown a grave headstone that tells you that the year is 1897, and we hang on that for way too long. I thought first time I noticed it. So <laughs> I'm an idiot. Oh, really? I, I never saw that grave before. Yeah. I don't know what it was that I missed it or anything. I'm, Cause I never knew what year this is supposed to take place in. Now I Sean, do. I'm, Sean, I'm with you. This is my first time noticing that too. First <laughs> time I'm like, Oh shit. The years on the grave. I never knew that. Yeah. But then, but now that you know what's going on, it's like, did it seem like it focused on that a little more than a normal movie would? Or was that like, eh, okay, this is the year that it is. I don't know. Somehow this is, you know, and this doesn't happen all the time because uh, uh, Split did actually surprise me. There was a kind of an awe and I was so hot on that movie because it took me by surprise. Right. So he can still do it. I was not it expecting is a movie that it. exists without the twist too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the twist, like on that one added an extra layer to me that just like, blew, well, you can listen to our best uh, movies of 2017 to hear our long discussion on split. Um, but uh, then listen to next year for our tiny discussion on glass. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, true. A tiny rant, I would say. Between <laughs> yeah. <you two. laughs> when M. Night Shyamalan resurrected his career and pissed it away within like two years of each other. 
Um, yeah. I mean, you got to listen to our After Earth episode. I'm sure we talked about his uh, the rise and fall and rise and then abrupt fall of M. Night Shyamalan. Um, so, okay. So the, what's actually going on here then, okay, the actual story that's happening is that William Hurt and Sigourney Weaver and Brennan Gleason and several other people uh, in the 1970s, I assume, right? Each one of them met at a, um, uh, like at a, uh, grief counseling. Yeah. Grief counseling. Yeah. Because each one of them lost someone in a horribly awful way to, uh, random city crime, it seemed like. Right. And so, uh, William Hurt being the son of a wealthy man who owns a forest preserve. And I'm not entirely sure. Like if we ever heard what grandfather did, they mentioned that. Mm, no, they just said he was really good with money. Yeah, and we know that William Hurt is a as a history teacher in school, which is kind of odd that he didn't follow his father into uh into industry or whatever, but I think that's like a philosophical difference that he has with his father, correct? Yeah. Uh so he says, Hey, we got this forest preserve, and so let's go out there and we'll build a village and we'll pretend that it's the eighteen hundreds. And we will raise our children away from all of this evil of modern society. Right. And we will yeah. speak like it is uh, ye old in English time with all the these and the thous and the here's and the why's and the wherefores. Why do they do that? Uh, okay. I was going to say, why does it have to be the 1800s to be like not violent? Which also, like, I mean, your community is not immune to, to rape and murder just because. You don't live in modern society. Right. Because yeah. human nature I, is human nature. Right. So mm. what makes this more safe? It's yeah. smaller. Small, it's smaller. It's smaller, more contained, basically. It's yeah, but why do you have to live like it's the 1800s, though? Well, yeah, right. that's, that's what I was going to say. Is I, I think because they say at one point that he was a history professor, I think in his mind this was the golden age. There's something about this time in history that he's fascinated with, so that's what he's focused on creating this universe in that time period, and he's convinced all these other people that it's a good idea. That's this, my theory. But this is the daffiest fucking, I mean, once you know what's going on, this becomes like one of the daffiest things that, like, it makes no goddamn sense. The Amish live among us right now in the year yeah. 2020 in communities like this one, but don't have to pretend that it's 1897 because, <laughs> right? They and, go shop at our stores and stuff. Yeah. They yeah. live a relatively normal yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Why not, why not just the Amish? This is like the Amish yeah. on oh, I guess steroids. This discussion then. is done. You know what, right? Sean? There's my wrap up. Why not just be why Amish? Why aren't they just you Amish? <laughs> but Colin, on that, there's like an extra level of cruelty to it because. He talks about how he watched Bryce Dallas Howard go blind. You watched your daughter go blind knowing she could get professional medical help and your vision of this perfect land was more important. Yes. That's fucked yes. up. That's fucked. That's, the, that's a dedication. Yeah. That is a dedicated man. Yeah, but this is, uh, yeah, eventually we got to get into the, to this. Because, uh, you know, that, that actually <laughs> that reminds, that reminds me of like a, there's kind of a parallel there. If you ever... If you ever know anything about like being a pastor's kid, there is definitely a parallel with like the like the greater good of like the flock over like my own family. There is like a struggle there in real life church families. The true horror. Yeah, it's it's like that's a real thing. Like, oh, you know, I'm I'm all about my my congregation, my flock and their own family kind of falls by the wayside. That's like a very real thing that happens in church society. So like. I can see that being a thing. I can see that actually happening. You guys were talking a lot of uh, uh, a lot about cults in the chat while we were watching the movie. Um, so this is is this a cult? Like what? Uh, what do yeah. we think? Well, absolutely. But it, it, well, the, well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember a lot of uh, like religious. Uh, talk amongst the townspeople. It doesn't have to be religious to be. A I know, I know, but no generally else. when we think of cults, we think it's some kind of like this is the the I, the the, uh, the a cult, theology. A cult, is, a cult is simply a shared belief in a community. Okay, so it's they based around a shared belief. Like, right, we we say cult. A commune that can that's just you know typically that's just people that really believe in you know self sufficiency within a community and just you know growing their own produce and that kind of thing and it's like a hippie commune kind of thing 
But tr- to traditional society, it's perceived as more of a cult. It's just a shared belief system. Yeah, so it's, it an, it's an ideology, to... not a theology that unites yeah, them. Yeah, basically. But cults usually do involve a level of isolation and brainwashing and yes. emotional manipulation. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Which is absolutely what is happening here, because this is the yeah. thing, the, the movie. But I, see, I, I wonder if this is part of uh, what, because I mean, now that we, we know where where everything falls into place, having seen it, like then you, you begin to ask yourself, is part of this what M. Night Shyamalan is actually, you know, he's an intelligent guy and he wrote it this way. It's like, is this what he's actually making criticisms about? Or is he using this to make criticisms? Um, although I still think that the whole idea that they determined that it's 1885, we're going to talk like uh, ye old English is a movie uh, uh, cliche because he wants to trick you, the viewer, into thinking that this movie takes place in 1897, even yeah. though it makes no sense that yeah. you know once you realize what the 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 twist is, it makes no sense that they would actually speak this way. And there's actually yeah. a scene early on, which I didn't catch before, but I caught this time when all the elders are sitting around uh like the uh the council and there's one woman who's like reading something out of a book and at some point she kind of puts it down and she laughs and then she starts talking in basically common english because she can't you know it's like well tis thee and i thine and you know and then she gives it up and she's like well you know we had to go to the bakery to go get you know whatever (laughs) right so it's like she does kind of break that but this is uh this is the hubris right of a filmmaker who is sitting there going like i am um I am building this thing that my kind of dim-witted audience is going to experience as I reveal it to them one step at a time and then they will be blown away by the flower of this uh this ending once it is revealed to them, right? Basically. Um this is ironically they an entire color. What's that? They outlawed an entire color. <laughs> yeah, they outlawed the color of blood, right? I mean, that's the idea. They're trying to be Basically. an innocent society that that abhors violence of any kind. So they've abhorred the color red. Or, uh, uh, like you uh, can't even allow red flowers to grow. And yep. they are alarmed. These kids are terrified when they see a red flower. But that mm-hmm. pays terrified. off in the scene where Adrian Brody is like bad color, bad color on his hands. Right. And then we're like, oh, that's the bad color. And that's why they're supposed to know when blood is shed that this is you have created this, uh, you know, forbidden or, or committed this uh, forbidden deed. Yeah, that this is bad. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want the comedy prequel to this movie where they're just starting and building the place and people are getting, like I said, people are getting scolded for for using a flashlight and shit. And yeah. And they're trying to break it, you know, trying to start up again. Um, I also think that within the universe of this movie, um, thinking back to how they started this thing, I think that in order to going by their thinking of complete isolation from the outside world that has, you know, corrupted them and hurt them in some way. Um, I think they had a, they talked about like, we have to break down our language. We have to start all over because the things we, how we talk now and everything can, we can, they can accidentally reference the outside world. So I think they all started Again, with the old timey language, I think they had so, to. This so basically, it was like their it was their function to like keep them in character. Yes, I think they had to. And oh, yes, in order to that, so they would not reference their outside right. world. So yeah, I think they like had when, to break it down to that basic old. And it's not as ye and thus and thou as Colin is as putting it forth. Yeah. It is a little bit, but Colin's like t thou for you and all that. And it's not quite that. It's, not it's like when you go to the it's like when you go to the Renaissance Fair and they can't break character even when like you're trying to get like a beer at the beer stand right. or whatever, you know. What wouldst thou like? We have thy Miller Light. Oh, yeah, <laughs> thy That's exactly what butt. it's like. Did, did anyone yeah. did anyone else think of the cable guy when they're at medieval times? There were no utensils times, so there are no utensils at medieval times. Would you like a refill on that Pepsi? <laughs> Thank you, Jeanine Garofalo. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we think about? Okay, so I mean, so this is the lofty goal, then, right? Like we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna raise our children in a, uh, a a world of utopia, right, where this kind of uh, city violence doesn't exist. The same uh, concept as homeschooling your kids. Yeah. 
It really is. That's what I tell my kid. There's monsters outside. You can't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to get to the monsters, but uh, but first of all, I mean, like, so are I mean, I guess this is my question: Are the uh, are these city elders or village elders? Are they heroes or villains? I mean, because I guess I was they're getting the biggest villains. Definitely the biggest they, villains. They are. Uh, I think they're Schrodinger's villains. I think it depends. Yeah, I mean, so, unless you know, they're not. He let his daughter go blind. <laughs> he did. I could have gone dedication. Yeah. Dedication. I'm surprised. No. Oh, I had one other question. Did they make glass? I saw a <laughs> lot of windows in this movie, I and I'm wondering where they came from. I know. And so was I. And there was also there was also a lot of paper. I was like, are they manufacturing their own paper? Or did they bring it with? Paper. I believe they could make the I glass. Mean, yeah, I'm like. I mean, you can make glass, but still, like that's a lot of that's effort. Kind of, that's, a, that's a lot of work. I'm, I There's imagine they're glass they've got, at the Renaissance Fair. I, well, okay. I think they've got Tella on standby, a secret route, <laughs> to get windows in there. I'm pretty sure. It'd be really funny if there was a scene where, like, one of the Pella stickers was left on the window, and one of the elders is frantically trying to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, see, the comedy version of this would be brilliant <laughs> and they I haven't done this the in parody movie version is good though not the scary movie version the straight okay. like like the, the technical the little like details mel, you would actually have to deal with like a mel brooks version something yeah something like that isn't or, it crazy they decided they don't want indoor plumbing yeah they, they know how to do toilets, it man they could have made it a, yeah they could have made some version of it and said nope yeah I, I, just, I think I, don't know. Like, I, I think that was a big discussion with these guys. Like, I think this is all part of the forming of the century. Because I, if it was me, I'd be like, my first thought would be like, we can pick and choose the best parts of everything mm -hmm. and bring them into our society. Right. Exactly. But I think, and I, I mean, you can never know unless you're brought up in a society where you just have all those things and it's normal. But I, I think they thought, no, we just need to keep it you know, right down to one era, just so it's not, it's easier. You're just you, going for simplicity. You are giving, uh, you're, I, I, know. I like that you're doing the legwork on this to try and make it work because I'm sitting there going like, no, it's M night Shyamalan trying to twist you. And so okay. it's gotta be well, 1897. It and that's is, why they don't have anything. No indoor the 1897 plumbing. 1897 thing is also the, he also made it in 1897. So he could have quote unquote monsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Like I need to have monsters, but I don't want it to be modern day because that would make it too easy to figure out all that shit. So the year allows him to get monsters into the movie. Did you remember, do you remember, and again, I, I don't know how old you all were when this movie came out, but there was advanced word that, that M night Shyamalan had made his first monster movie when this came I mean, out. I remember the trailers heavily implying there was monsters. Okay. You know? yeah. Yep. yeah. This is another I factor. I went into expecting monsters. I think this is another yep. factor that has contributed to the ill will that this movie maintains to this day. Yes. <laughs> because you I promise agree. a monster movie, you got to deliver monsters. I think that's like a, that's a bargain that audiences are not willing to go with like, oh, it was all fake. There are no actual monsters. Yeah. See my disappointment with It Comes at Night from yeah. like two years ago. <laughs> and there was like nothing in that movie. Yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, also, we're going to spoil every A24 movie, just so you know, <laughs> audience. Um, when it's we been get like angry, two years just, since that movie came out. We just shout things when we're angry, so who knows? Actually, It Comes at Night might have just been a little ahead of its time, because if it would have come out it in was. 2020, we'd be loving that movie right now. Right, yeah, it was it's a COVID ahead movie. Of its time. Yeah. Um, okay, so so they the village elders then do come up with a plan because you know, like, well, at some point your kids are going to grow up and they're going to want to go outside the forest, and we know that this is a maybe circular forest preserve almost. I think you do see it on a map later, but it's a little, it's a it's a, a pasture, glade, field, whatever, in the middle of a wooded forest area. Um, Valley color. And so, what's well, that? No, that's not what you call it. It's a flat. It's what like did a, they call a it? Clearing. About? There you go. A, a wide clearing. <laughs> we live in, the in a woods. clearing. And so, at, at some point, your kids are going to want to go and explore, and so you got to keep them inside. How do you do that? Monsters. Here, there be monsters. Right. <laughs> there are monsters. William Hurt in says, the woods. In the easiest thing to do for children. There's monsters in the woods, and they will eat you. 
all their children are now yeah. in their 20s is the thing and they still believe in these monsters because the adults have come up with a way to actually make them real to them and that is what kill a child oh wait <laughs> wow i would respect if, this movie more if it did right if they're willing to let her go blind they should be willing to kill a child just saying because well, they should have done it with is, Jesse Eisenberg. What is your dedication level? Yeah. All right, to this cause of yours, you're gonna to, kill kids to preserve the innocence. We have to keep up this farce and fill their head with lies and completely like, yeah. When um, Jesse Eisenberg was like taunting the monsters, they should have actually just committed and done it then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they create these. Uh, I mean, as far as monsters go, we don't really get a very good look at them. For we know that they're hooded, uh, re- red robed. Uh, creatures like, with exposed bones and spiky porcupine looking things that God humanoid look at I know looking at that and the early parts of this movie it disappoints me again like I feel disappointed again that they're not real <sighs> this movie shot beautifully by uh, Roger Deakins yes oh, it is uh, that Beautiful man movie. just is like uh, I mean as far as cinema right he can do things with light and you're going to watch the movie going like what the fuck are you talking about colin he does things with uh just the, the the like i mean i don't know how he does it but there's a um what would you call it it's like a not a focus setting like an iris you know you got to open the thing he maintains a uh, balance between the hues of color, the brightness and contrast of colors and makes these indoor scenes that are lit by firelight look fantastic. And he knows how to mm. light backgrounds in the dark. You know, uh, he did uh, um, just recently Blade Runner 2049. He won the Oscar for, I think. Uh, I don't know if that was his first. I don't believe that it was. He was he's on this show for the Big Lebowski. He shot. He shoots a bunch of Coen Brothers movies, a lot of Denny Villeneuve movies. He did uh, uh, Skyfall. He also Fall. shot uh, uh, San Francisco 2020. Did you guys see that one? No. It's a joke. San Francisco's orange right now. Oh, so it looks uh, like 2049. 2049 shot. That one, that one really um, <laughs> he, he shot previous freak show movie in time. Oh, did he? So he is on the wall yeah. of frame. Oh, so shit. This would be his third one. We did Big Lebowski oh, yeah. in time and now uh, tonight's movie, The Village. Fuck okay. that Oscar. He's on the wall now. That's right. <laughs> Welcome, sir. We need like some kind of musical stinger to happen whenever we do. Yeah, this we do. Um, and, uh, Blade, Blade <laughs> was his first Oscar. Blade Runner was his first Oscar? Yeah, Holy yeah, fuck. He, he, oh, he yeah. Has two. He has one for Blade Runner 20, uh, 49 and 1917. Those are his only two. That's criminal. That's Isn't like, that's fucked up. That's yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised he did it for No Country. Yeah. I, yeah. I borrowed when I when I made my uh, short film Witchfinder. I remember watching the the uh, assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford over and over again to try and figure out like how to uh, how to do some lighting things. I was stealing from Roger Deakins. Um, Wasn't he double nominated and still didn't win? What? I think What's so. That? I think one year he was double nominated and still didn't win. Yeah, he was. I don't remember. Uh, I think it was. Did he do There Will Be Blood? That feel if he didn't, it feels like uh uh that feels like it. The yeah, the um I think it was Paul, that no country or whatever whatever that year was. He was nominated for two things and still in the same year. He's yeah. been working forever. He did like Sid and Nancy oh, yeah. like way the hell back in the eighties. Yeah. So I mean he's getting old, so we don't have very much Roger Deacons left to go, but uh uh yeah. probably the greatest working cinematographer maybe working today. Um, okay, so sorry, sorry, sidetrack. Uh, <laughs> um, so they basically they create these uh creatures, the adults wander around at night, and which is always kind of funny because whenever you're hearing these howls off in the distance and all that, you just got to go like, Well, who's not at the, the dinner table? But we're told later they engineered these sounds, so who knows if they have recording devices out there or whatever. Uh, they're making sounds to basically scare all the kids and make them believe that there are monsters out there. Um, but what 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 has happened is before the movie starts adrian brody plays a character who's kind of uh he's like the village simpleton right yes um but he has discovered uh through mischief he has discovered that the adults um are using yeah he's discovered that they're using the that it's all fake 
he hasn't told anyone but if you watch his reactions to everything that happens in this movie because he's always giddy and laughing they're coming they're coming he's always very excited because he knows that this is a game right i think that's how he sees it he sees this as a game what else is also confusing is that he is uh, a budding serial killer or some kind of disturbed individual who's going around and skinning animals and leaving them all over the village which is uh, everyone believes is because it's the monsters doing it but it's actually adrian brody the other vill- village elders think it's somebody another one of the village elders or something we never really find out where that uh uh th- plot thread gr- goes but it's him right he's a mm-hmm. disturbed psychotic uh individual who has fallen in love with bryce dallas howard who has yeah. fallen in love with Joaquin Phoenix. Right. <laughs> and there becomes here, the central uh, gist of the here's, movie. Here's where I have a major issue with M. Night Shyamalan's uh, thought process behind this. Is he trying to get the audience to to accept that Adrian Brody's character is a villain? So is he making a mentally a mentally challenged person a villain in this movie? I I have an issue with this. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to how to express this because it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. I I feel like you know Michaela was saying earlier that the elders are like the true villains of this, and I feel like this is a prime example because this boy this guy needs help. He needs professional guidance. And I don't think these crimes are necessarily his fault because he is mentally disabled in, in many ways. You know, they, they never say what he is or anything, but it's very clear that he is a mentally challenged individual and he's not entirely aware of what he's doing when he does these things. Well, I mean, so I, think it- I, I, don't, I have an issue that he's portrayed as like the villain in this because that's the feeling that I got. Like it, it's it's kind of like disturbing. By the end of the movie, the, he's definitely the villain, but they they let him they let the the movie lets the characters off the hook in a way that I kind of find, I guess, uh, cheap because your characters never have to deal with the moral ramifications of something, right? Uh, yeah. The the idea that like apparently until now this this community has been crime free. Right. So they do at some point once he he stabs in a jealous rage, he stabs. Uh, well, no, it's a calculated, you know, attempted attempted murder. He tries to yeah. murder uh, his love rival, Joaquin Phoenix, even though the two of them are friends uh, and they lock him up. Right. Because they're like they don't have a jail. So they put him in the quiet room, which is apparently is the punishment room. And then the and question gets the shit slapped out. <laughs> right. By by Bryce Dallas Howard, but nobody else, because I think they're basically the community is trying to figure out, like, well, how do we deal with an actual crime? This is an attempted murder. What are we going to do here? Right. I mean, how do we this innocent society deal with crime in our midst? We're going to have to eventually like, I mean, do you try him? Do you is there corporal punishment? I mean, do we they just haven't figured any of that? Shit they out. haven't figured. But the thing is, the movie takes that away from them, which, I, you know, would be an interesting and fascinating thing to explore. And again, that's not where the movie wants to go. The movie lets him he escapes and then he puts on the cape and he goes out and b- pretends to be a monster and. Uh, uh, torments Bryce Dallas Howard in the woods and she kills him and then that moral question is uh, erased and actually his death gives them reason because then they take it and they spin it and turn it into this web of lies so they yeah. can keep their uh, utopian existence still I go- think this, that's oh my God, where it's like still the- go I think it's still <laughs> pointing to the elders as the villains because they I, take I, it yeah. and use it for personal reasons and well, to, to keep greater, it going they're the greater villains, the greater good right yeah the the greater yeah the overseers yeah. he is a, he is a villain and doing things because uh, he sees the world in a very simple way and his way is you know it's like this guy is stealing my girl from me so you get rid of the guy i think that i'm gonna be really generous to this movie for a second but i think that in the better version of this movie where it really explores like the horrors of being in a cult and being manipulated that way. I think that character would serve to kind of represent like a nature versus nurture thing. Like you can take a human out of the modern environment, but human evilness and will is still going to take over at some point. Um, I think that's kind of like, it would make the statement that like, it's just nature. Some people are just evil, but I don't think this movie 
does any of that work to say that? I think it's much more straightforward and simple than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like they use the fact that he's mentally challenged as like the, like the crutch to make that statement. Like instead of just saying, Oh, he's a bad person. Cause sometimes people just do shitty things. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't think yeah. this movie doesn't believe in, in evil, in true evil. This movie yeah. says that there's basically like, you know, I mean, I mean, he is a sympathetic character, you know, uh, because of his situation. It's like, that's why Bryce Dallas Howard helps him when other kids, I can't remember. Do they make fun of him at the beginning? But basically, no, I think he's just generally accepted. You get the idea that she has a special, like, uh, you know, cause she's blind. She's handicapped. So she's helping him because he's mentally handicapped. They have a special, relationship yeah. based on on that um and to them just, the, the evil is the outside world and we're going to deal with the situation within our community ourselves but again we never yeah. get to explore how they deal with this like breaking of the societal contract <laughs> you know uh it's still happens. funny that <clears throat> that the evil is in the outside world but these people the elders are from that world Mm -hmm. yeah. So to completely yeah, isolate the evil is not possible. They bring it in for as much as they're trying to keep it out because they're from there. They still bring it in. And the circumstances of that are throughout this movie, I think. Yeah, this, like they are the cause of it. I feel like this movie would be way easier to buy into if it had been several generations removed of them going off into like their separate society, but like this your, is like, what maybe 20 years they've been doing it max. Yeah. Cause the kids, yeah, the oldest well. kid is like 21 or something like that. Yeah. Right? yeah Cause the Joaquin Phoenix was a baby and he was like the first child we brought in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Brendan Gleason says that his, his other, his family has died here. You know, it's like, this is a place that they want to maintain. Uh, they do like this lifestyle. Um, and this is the big greatest challenge. I think that they've faced, you know, to that, the threat to that lifestyle is this murder or attempted murder that happens. Um, so, um, were you more disappointed by the reveal that the monsters weren't real or that the film took place? Monsters. <laughs> oh, no, modern day, for sure. Monsters. Michaela saying modern day, Sean saying the monsters. Monsters. I mean, yeah. Yeah, the monsters. It's, it, yeah, monsters not being real. I'm just like, oh, come on. That could have been cool. Well, yeah. like, I, after that reveal, I still had hope that the movie could still be good. Once the modern day reveal comes in, all hope is gone. Like, this, see, there's elements of the modern day reveal that I do like. So I can get something from that review. What do you like? The monster thing is just full disappointment. Mm -hmm. Well, the, but it's even. Yeah, what do you like about it? Yeah. What do you the like? Reveal? About, yeah. Yeah. Ab about it being what modern are, day. What are the good things? I like. Um, I like the. It's all kind of there's a lot of there's a point in this movie. Where there's a lot of exposition dump. Um. But some of it I like. I like the. I like that they have all the black boxes in everyone's house of, uh, of the reasons why they decided to do this is something being there to remind them. I like the stories that are told throughout the movie that come back in and the reveal when he holds up the picture of the grief counseling thing. I still like. It's the combination of, I think the actors and the music and just the way it's shot. Um, I do like it i feel i i get the re at that point i get the reasoning as to why they would want to do this logistically maybe n none of it works out and it's all crap and all that stuff but i appreciate the maybe it's just the emotional reason why these characters are doing it and so that reveal never bothered me whether you saw it coming or not um but i like it i like the reasons why they're doing it everything else after that gets complicated even by though it's actually shit, but, yeah, but that's what we're saying it's like it makes this a sympathetic it's making a sympathetic argument for something that is uh, like morally highly dubious, right? The idea that you are well, yeah. The 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 what is it? The path to hell's paved with good intentions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that is it, and that's with all the. I mean, ultimately, with all the good intentions that the elders have, they're still the like we said, the overall evil, like they're still responsible for these bad things that have happened. Well, the, as the movie tries to pull the, the, the wool over our eyes, right. The, the reveal is that with Joaquin Phoenix being injured, but not dead, 
he needs medical attention, namely penicillin, I suppose, which they don't have. And so they elect to send uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, who is blind. They're going to send her out into the woods and she's going to go to what they call the towns to go get medical help. They've written it down. She can't read what it is. Uh, and they're going to send her out to go get. And so she, uh, William Hurt takes her into a, into the basement of a house and reveals that, Hey, this whole thing is a joke, right? Uh, See, or a farce. That's, there's, there's a moment that I like and within the whole thing. Maybe it doesn't matter much, but when he is telling her the story of his father and taking her to the shed, I especially love the moment where he goes to the door and he's like, try your best not to scream. And she's like, what? I think moments like that, I, I still love watching. Well, I still think they're great. This is the thing. It's like Shyamalan is a really good filmmaker, right? And so the way that he does that is, you know, try not to scream. Then we're going to cut to uh, later. We're going to, we're going to, yeah. we're going to skip over the scene where he explains that we're going to hold that. So we can show you that at a, at a moment in time later in the movie when it will have the most impact. I mean, like mm -hmm. this guy, that's what I'm saying. It's like to underestimate Shyamalan is at your own peril. He's a really good filmmaker studied from Hitchcock. I mean, obviously he is borrowing a lot of this stuff and, you know, rhythms and, you know, reveals and all this stuff from Alfred Hitchcock. But, uh, it's just, it's, it's at it, my problem with Shyamalan usually comes down to it's that the service of a concept that's really built on rickety legs, you know, and, uh, you yeah. go like, but wait, and the whole thing fucking falls apart. And then you're like, yeah, you can't, you can't think about his ideas, but you had great casting and you had fantastic dialogue and goddamn the performances are great. And you know, the photography is by Roger Deakins and you know, you're like, but it's all in service of what, um, yeah. so he sends her off into the woods to go, uh, to, to find the, um, the, the towns. He shows her that these are costumes, the monsters. They're not real. They're costumes that we built to scare you guys, right? To keep you from going to the towns. Okay, so this is this is uh, like a problem that I have with them. A big problem that I have with the movie is that basically he says it's all fake, and then three minutes later, Shyamalan's like, "But what if it wasn't fake? I'm gonna still you don't know. Maybe I'm I'm not Shyamalan. You know, it could actually be real because there's a voiceover that she remembers uh, of William Hurt saying like, "Well, we took the inspiration from real stories of, you know, our uh, stories of goblins and ghouls that lived in the woods that I okay, read he in does history not say books. That. Whatever, whatever he says. <laughs> he said creatures. Uh, right? forest not, creatures. There's no talk of goblins and ghouls, Colin. <laughs> and so then it's like, <laughs> we just said pot. all this stuff was fake, but is it real? And then she runs into a monster. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, what did what you, did you I mean, do you, do you remember? What do you think at this point? Like, if you can remember back to the first time you watched it, or are you just like, oh, do you think there's a monster? Or do you just think somebody from the town is dressed up as something and following her? I mean, at this point, I figure somebody from the town is dressed up and is following her. As much as I want it to be a monster, goddammit. <laughs> I know it's just a person in a costume, <laughs> which pretty much explains all of adult movie viewing at this point. Yeah, but that's I basically want it to be real. But this is my problem with his thought process at this point. He thought that even though you were thinking that, Sean, you were mm. thinking that it's probably a guy running around in a costume. Mm -hmm. He still thought there was wiggle room there, right? And they they told you it was a guy in a costume. There's wiggle room. You still. I have you in my grip and you will believe whatever I tell you, you, yes. you know, slow witted movie patron. <laughs> this Does is he not get any studio intervention or something. He's I'm not just love he, him and let him do whatever for the a while. he wants. I mean, yeah, do, for a while he didn't. Do you think, do you think really though, that that was for the audience or that was just to drive that part of the story forward? Like, do you really think his audience, like he thought that his audience was going to be on board of like, Oh no, they are real. Or was it just a device to keep the, the story going forward and to progress to her killing Noah? Why couldn't you have held that? Why couldn't you have held the reveal that it was because of his editing choices of delaying what she saw in the, 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 uh, the, the room, the basement. Why couldn't you hold that reveal until after Noah is killed? Noah's the Adrian Brody character. 
That might have been a better choice. But that's what I'm saying. Hubris, right? This guy is like, no, I'm going to be able to do this and then do this. And they're going to be with me every step of the way. And I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to be shocked and surprised. And yeah. it's like, and because he's done things before, the studio's like, uh, he's a all genius. right, I, I, he can do it. I, I guess he I, can do it. I will, I, will say, though, I will say that I don't know that the average moviegoer would be as apprehensive as we are. I think that some of these twists work on more people than you think they do. So Probably. they go with him where he like, uh, it's all fake. I know. No, wait, maybe it's not fake. Don't analyze movies the way we do and look <laughs> into them the way we do. And they would follow that to the end. All right. I'm going to say something here that is going to be extremely controversial. I think that compared to M night Shyamalan, right? Who's a very pretentious filmmaker. I think Christopher Nolan is an unpretentious filmmaker because he, I watched Tenet and this is a guy who is like, so uh, assured of like what he's doing that you're going to understand it. And you sit there going like, what the, f- what? hold on, Chris, what are, what are we talking about here? <laughs> Slow down for a minute. And he's just like, no, 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 they get it. They get it. We're going to keep going. Shyamalan's I agree like, with you, <laughs> Shyamalan's like, Ooh, they don't get it. And I'm yeah. going to keep hiding it from. <laughs> well, remember when um, Inception came out, the biggest critical complaint against that movie was that um, Ellen Page's character was just a surrogate for the audience. And it would, the whole movie was just people explaining things to her. Well, yeah. Could you imagine that movie if no one explained anything? <laughs> right. Yeah. Wait until you see Tenet. It is like a half of the movie is people explaining things to each other. And you're going That's like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to use the pause button a lot just to go stop. Okay. Well, now wait, what did I just hear? The movie doesn't give you a time for that. It's on to the next thing. And you're like, you got to be, you know, on your coffee and you watch that movie. Uh, <laughs> so eventually she does make it to the towns. What does she find? A park ranger. The world's most understanding park ranger, a guy named Kevin, who uh, doesn't blow her cover because that is also the thing that like, in order for the movie logic to succeed, you can't, you have to meet the right guy. It's like the hunt for out October. You got to find that, that American who understands you're trying to defect. She finds him and his name is Kevin. Kevin, of course, has to go and raid the penicillin stash of M. Night Shyamalan himself. What do we think of director cameos in movies? Depends. If they're small, it's fine. They're like, this one didn't bother me. As long as it's not Lady in the Water type, then we're fine. That's not even a cameo. He's just straight up has a role in that movie. Yeah. He's just, that's, woo. And he's the writer. That's like his title in he's, that movie. He's, he's the, the savior. He's yeah. the savior of humanity in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big, 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 <laughs> so, that movie. But because Long of this kind of stuff, it's so bad. It's like, oh my God, the ego on this man is so <laughs> fucking huge. It's like, you know, but I sit there and I'm like, yeah, he's a really good filmmaker, but his ego is fucking out of control. Like Maverick, it's writing checks that his body can't can't. No, that's not right. But <laughs> you know, it's like the, uh, it's off putting to have him put in interject when Alfred Hitchcock would walk through. This is why he's doing it. Alfred Hitchcock would walk through a scene and it'd be funny. Cause like, Oh, there's Alfred Hitchcock waiting for a train or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. the bus store is closed on him. And right. my Shyamalan Stephen gives King him significant right, roles. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm unoffended by seeing Stephen King in a movie. Um, mm-hmm. But Shyamalan, it offends me whenever I see him in a movie because he gives yeah. himself like these. Uh, uh, does it bother you when Tarantino does that, Colin? Ironically, no. In fucking Django and Jane, it did. I just didn't what like his Pulp character. Fiction? No, I liked uh, Jimmy, <laughs> and I <laughs> that was a good performance. I think that's pretty, giving himself a role. That's very true. That's very true. Very okay, true. all right. I, I think Shyamalan topped out at signs. I think that was the perfect amount to be in a movie, and then everything after that, he just went. Was he? Was he but nuts. Tarantino was an actor in other people's movies. Shyamalan, I don't think, has ever acted in anybody else's movies, right? I don't think so. Yeah, but okay. you don't have to write yourself a fucking role in your own movie, though. That's very true. Unless you're an it's awesome the same problem you have with Shyamalan. <laughs> I have a problem with everybody doing it. <laughs> well, uh, at the uh, Does he have a cameo in Split. 
it seems to me, yes, he's a IT I don't guy. No, he was an IT guy in Glass. Who was he in Split? He was. Um, he's in Split. I can't remember. Isn't he the IT guy in Split? No, no. I think that's a, in in Glass. But I think doesn't he do it in both? Maybe, maybe he, he works at the park or something. And yeah, and I can't remember the exact role. But I think he's, he's the in, IT guy in Split. He's like, yeah, yeah. Goes over to her house and is like, oh, you can do this. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He works at the store in glass. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, I guess we got to breach this at some point. Uh, it's the, the movie is made in 2004. This is M night Shyamalan's, I think maybe first movie after the September 11th attacks. Uh, there was a lot of talk at that point, uh, in time with the political situation with a guy named Walker, as the uh, the guy who's uh, overseeing the village, right, which is George Walker uh, Bush, uh, that he's a surrogate for Bush. And the whole thing was a criticism of Bush saying that basically Islamic terror and the war on terror is a fake thing that we're using as fear to keep Americans um, uh, in line. That's the issue that the village is, is presenting, according to M. Night Shyamalan. That's a real stretch. Right. That's a real stretch. <laughs> well, because he is <laughs> Did saying. Did you find that in Infowars or something? Did Alex Jones tell you that? No. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan, I think at some point, made some kind of connection. And I can't remember if he actually made the walker to, you know, uh, uh, to George W. at that time. But there was, I mean, when you read reviews at the time, that's what everybody was talking about. It's like, this is M. Night Shyamalan making a critique. On the war on terror. I know you guys don't remember. Not this. everything's that deep. It was Not everything has a meaning like that. You know, sometimes a movie's just a shitty movie. I do like the fact that you can watch the movie now and you can see it without those kind of, uh, you know, contemporary connections. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder how land of the dead would hold up, <laughs> you know, if you watch that now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we're basically saying that like this whole idea, I mean, I think we're all agree on this, that the whole idea that they are sitting around and, and, and pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. Like these guys are, even though they're uh, of good intentions, this is a monstrous thing to do to people, to lie to them and tell them that like, you know, there's monsters out there and we're, we're, we're keeping this lie going in order to maintain the sanctity of our innocent village right we agreed on that Oof, now i can't not see it <laughs> now that's all i see in this movie <clears throat> yeah you're good yeah colin you're sounding a lot like the people that believe stanley kubrick faked the moon landing and wrote all about it in the shining no but this well, is uh, did this you is... read now those people are back and say he's not talented yeah, this is uh, this is film theory. You're supposed to read movies yeah. like this, especially when the the uh, filmmaker basically says that this is my statement. You know? Yeah. About, okay. How long after this movie came out did he say that? I think like in part of the promotion of the movie. Yeah, but like that doesn't in mean that was his thought while he was writing the movie. I think it was. <laughs> like I said, the fact that he's calling the guy Walker is not a coincidence. This is his statement. But if you're the if if he's the only one that noticed it, then he didn't do it very well. No, it was it was that's what I'm saying. You have to go back and read the contemporary reviews of the time. This yeah, was Yeah, but if you're on saying on the press mind. tour, if you're saying on the press tour he's telling everyone this is what it's about, then we don't really know if anyone picked up on it organically or not. If he's already saying that this is what it's well, about. Well, maybe I'm remembering it wrong. I can't remember if it was the critics all picking up on this, but I'll go back and look. Um all right. Well, do we have any final words of parting wisdom to our listeners on the village? Yes. When she was holding the berries and they were like, that's the bad color. Why did they tell her that? She wouldn't so, have known. So a monster didn't just run up and kill her. Yeah. So they, I should, guess. So they should drop them. I guess. I mean, what? Couldn't they... This is so much. This just like they made this uh, life in 1897. Couldn't they have just said, hey, were, were there not medications at all in 1897? Couldn't they just call them something else and had there them piped were. in? There were. There were some medications in, in the 1800s. Yeah. You would think, right? There but were. they would get there those were. at yeah. like the general store or the apothecary, which would have like a supply run from a town or something like some, that. Yeah. yeah. Just because the towns are evil doesn't mean you don't need some of that shit every now and again. It's because yeah. of the medicine in the 
Snickers was opium, Sean. That's I know. Cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> it's cocaine. But they, they, there's no they can plant poppy seeds. There's no reason for them not to have medication in this town. Because injuries None. and shit are gonna happen. Like, right, no matter what. Inevitable. Some dude some dude's putting up a, a a a fence and puts a nail through his thumb. Not to mention just childbirth. That like, do yeah. What are they normally. doing? Yeah, I know. I'm just <laughs> you guys well, okay. God damn it, Holly, you're making me hate the village. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Um so Colin talked about uh the theory that this was his response to 9-11. Um, has anyone heard of the book Running Out of Time? No. No? It is a young adult book that came out before this movie, and it is about a village where people think they live in the 1800s when actually it's the present day, and the heroine of the book goes searching for medical supplies. The village elders take steps to make sure the children never learn the truth about the world. Wow. I mean, isn't that what Shyamalan does? He just steals from everything? Are you yeah, afraid of the dark? Not, that book? Kind of. Margaret Peterson is the author of the book, and she very much wanted to sue him for for this movie. What year was that book written? I I don't think she was ever able to. What year was the book written? That I don't remember. It was before, well before this movie, but I don't remember what year it was. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to ask you Holly cuz you've done all the research on this movie. Here's a little factoid. I don't know, we're going to we're going to find out if it's true. Ashton Kutcher was originally cast in The Village. That is true. Which part? <laughs> He uh, he was um, he was Noah. Lucius Hunt was written for Joaquin Phoenix. Ashton Kutcher was Noah. Yeah, there you go. Could yeah, have been a whole different. That would have been really. And um, Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten Dunst was cast in uh, Bryce Dallas Howard's role, and she ended up dropping out to do another movie. Well, this I think was the first time that I was aware of Bryce Dallas Howard. Is that correct? Was this yeah. her first movie? And like, I mean, yeah. she makes an impression. Like, okay, this is a good actress. You know, right off yes. the get go. Sure. But I think it's because, again, I'm saying that Shyamalan writes good character parts and gives people long takes and they get to act in his movie. A lot of long takes in this movie. Yeah. I liked it. Um, and he does write. Uh, I also like the I want to point out before we leave the scene on the front porch, which is one of my absolute favorite scenes from this movie, where it's just yeah. Joaquin Phoenix and her talking the dialogue, the acting, the fact that she got the tear to come out on the side that was not facing camera and still drop. Beautiful. Gorgeous. That was planned. Yeah. It, uh, whatever. I don't care. Beautiful. One of the best things I've seen. Not a lot of CG in this movie. No. That we could no tell. For it. Yeah. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some specialness done to this, uh, some touch-ups or something done to the monsters in some scenes where they look more fluid than being people. Mm. There's some weird thing going on, but other than that, no, not really. Dead animals are all built and put around and all yeah, that. The, yeah. monst- the monsters were designed a little differently. They looked more, I think they were designed to be lions. Uh, yes. They were designed to look more like lions and they were like on all fours. And then when they like saw the, they, when they saw them on camera, it was like, no, this isn't going to work at all. So they redesigned them. Designed by I- a guy named Crash McCreary, I think was his name, right? <laughs> what did, do we ever figure out what Brick Mason did? <laughs> no. Brick, Brick Mason. So oh, Jesus. At, the, at the end when they're talking about how they have like it set up so that planes are diverted and they never fly over the village. So they set up a plan for that, but still skipped over the whole indoor plumbing thing. Yes. And yeah, indoor plumbing and medication. Well, we're gonna make sure the planes yeah. don't fly. That's a good point. The planes yeah. aren't gonna fly over, but we're not gonna be able to shit inside. Yeah. Well, and how much does it cost them to pay someone off to make sure f- planes don't fly over? Right. Yeah. That's a fucking lot. Yeah. 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 For twenty well, you've years. You've got pull. You know, it's like uh, yeah. I love yeah. that Shyamalan was like, "That's the thing people are gonna nitpick me for is planes flying over." So I'm gonna make sure yeah. that's really well explained. To like, be you know, honest, I, wanted- I had that thought when I first saw it. when that reveal was going on. I'm like, "How do you keep like planes from flying?" Yeah, you have to address it in your in you your do, dialogue. But I also want to know how much money he has that he's paying salaries of all these guards. Yeah, right. Like, uh, yeah, and is he still making this money now that he's yeah? In there? Does he have someone like managing his money oh, and yeah. investing? the outside yeah the company is still even though he he's just one of the sons right does he does he show up to board meetings to show up to board meetings once a year dressed in his (laughs) dressed in his get up like does he pull up on a horse (laughs) why are there no horses here i didn't see any horses Uh, yeah that's true because you don't there's nowhere to go yeah it's a glade field 
A they field, get a lot of field, Sean. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we have uh, we have gone over our time here on the village, but uh, thanks for sticking with it. I, this wasn't as funny as uh, some of our other. We went we, like deep into the village. No, because we we all I think we all we all want M Night Shyamalan to do better. We want him to do good. We know he can do so, better. Yeah. So we don't enjoy when he doesn't do good. Yeah. So we don't make fun of it as much. Colin, we're not mad. We're just disappointed. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. I think it is. That's, that's very it. true. Uh, we inducted another uh, fellow, another chap, into the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Uh, MF Mad, the keeper of the walls, let us know that Charlie McDermott, you know him. He was in The Village. He was also in Hot Tub Time Machine. And he was in Countdown. He was one of the kids. Is he the husband? In The Village. No, he's the, one of the no, kids. Who doesn't like his shirts get wrinkled? Yeah, he's oh, grown up, and then he was in Countdown. Okay. We did Countdown. Remember that? What about a cast the for this movie. Grim Reaper way. app. Yeah. I know. Yeah, everybody. Top to really bottom. Yeah, everybody's in this movie. Yeah. Um, all doing good all right so i'll tell you what we're going to tell you whether or not we recommend the bill i know this is ironic that you've already seen it and you're listening but so we're going to give it a review we're each going to go around the table review the village but before then holly clap <laughs> before then we're going to need uh to summon our mailman and his name is igor holly's going to clap for him right now I don't know what's going on yet. We're only getting like one, one. Yeah. Uh, here, hold on. I'll do it. One. I'll do it. I'll do it. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. The easiest explanation to this whole thing. And it took us till now to figure it out. Colin clap. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I mean, I'm hoping that that came through. I don't know. It did. I heard it. For us, so. yeah. Okay. Weird COVID era audio duplex. Really uh, shown the bath on air. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, first of all, we should probably let you know how you can write and join the Freak Show family. You can follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Maybe Twitter's your thing. At Sat Freak Show. Perhaps you're an emailer. Saturday Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Hey, you, you know, are so you an emailer? An emailer? <laughs> you use the email. Hey, we're there. Yes. It doesn't matter. We're there. We're ready to embrace you. We are on yes. email. Uh, and uh, on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Well, Johnny, New Jersey writes in and says, I'm sorry for the late message, but I wanted to say happy 400th episode to you all. To say I look forward to each episode every week would be an understatement. I really appreciate every laugh you guys give me, along with the movie nerd knowledge only folks like us can appreciate. You all feel like familiar friends to every listener, and that's what makes the show great. Personally, I feel I share all of your movie favorites, so each show is a fun learning adventure or a fun nostalgic trip, and I at times feel like the fifth unofficial member of the freak show Aww. Aww. we hope y'all do well thank you very much johnny uh ocelot ademska says i wish i had more to say other than you guys rock there's a ton of movies i've gotten to experience for the first time because of you and as bad and as campy as some can be they're still good more or less keep it up saturday night crew hearing you guys is a bright spot on my week oh thank you Aww, that's thank you sweet. that's really sweet <laughs> I like the way I still, it, it blows my mind that there are people playing along home and watch the movies. There's some of the crazy shit that we, that we come up with like, well, you're right. going to have to go hunting for this one because it's not available anywhere kind of thing. Right. You have to download an app and then follow <laughs> three links. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I'm just surprised people listen. I'm like, oh, well, right? wait. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. For sure. Um, well, Teresa Ann, <laughs> Teresa Ann listens. <laughs> She, uh, about the village is probably the most excited listener. When we announced that we were doing this, she said, yes, this is a long time coming. Agreed. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Apple Eva said, uh, about the village that he f kind of figured out the twist midway through came away with the revelation that Bryce Dallas Howard could really act. Yeah, she's pretty good. Uh, Tyler. I, yeah, she's good, but she's, let's be real. She still is poor man's Jessica Chastain. Oof. Maybe Damn. she hasn't had her chance to shine. Maybe her star was diminished by Gwen Stacy. Maybe maybe the new Jurassic World picture will just Oh, I'm put sure. Put her put her right up there. there I'm sure it definitely won't be a sexist movie at all and definitely won't, you know, be a retread of something we've seen already. Not at all. Uh, Tyler, yeah, it'll be fine. 
Tyler Hoffman says, I remember watching The Village in the theater and how it reminded me of a book I had read from my middle school library. Maybe this is the book you're talking about, Holly. Also, Bryce Dallas Howard sounds like the perfect name for a kid with a rat tail and a severe Mountain Dew addiction. Love the show, you guys. I've been listening for Bryce a few Dallas years Howard, now. Get your butt in here now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like one of Ricky Bobby's kids in Talladega Nights. Bryce you Dallas Howard. those nails and get in here. <laughs> Everybody knows, right, that she's the daughter of Ron Howard. Opie, right? Little Opie Taylor. Ricky County. Ricky County. There was County only no nepotism involved with her career, right? Yeah. Well, she's talented. I mean, she is good. Um, is James Newton Howard a relative? No. Okay. But he did the music to this, right? Yeah. He's uh, Shyamalan's like go to guy. Uh, Jacob Law says, I was with it until the Adrian Brody twist and the final twist. It felt like M. Night was giving the finger to the audience. Uh, Mark Zidane says the secret twist for the movie is M. Night Shyamalan's career ending. After this, every movie was garbage. Split gave us hope, then it was taken away again by glass. Y'all. Spot on. Looks good, man. Looks uh, good. Jacob Kotner says this movie would have benefited from having no hype, but that was inescapable. Shyamalan had set us up with three great movies, and we expected this one to top them all, but there, this was a different beast. And when I find out, found out that the monsters I came to see from the trailers were just people in costumes, I was disappointed. Well, you yep. and a lot of people. yeah, You yep. and th- all of America. <laughs> and the world. Uh, Michael Whitaker said, Oh, my heart breaks after three good movies. This one was the sign. It was going to be rough with M night Shyamalan movies for a while. He always filmed somewhere near where I live. So I usually have to support his movies one way or another. And I really didn't hate this one, but the twist was kind of predictable on a side note. You may hate his movies, but apparently he throws a kick-ass Halloween party in Philadelphia every year called Shyamalan. Shyamalan, 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 Shyamalan. He says often celebrity. It's often with celebrities, and it's open to the public for charity. There you go. I mean, that's that's Shyamalan. cool. But he's got to make it about himself, right? Yeah, Shyamalan. Oh yeah. Does he go as himself for Halloween? That would be funny. <laughs> no, he goes- Sean. He goes as his cameos. <laughs> oh. Probably. Uh, I would say he probably at least dresses like his characters. At least. If- if we do, we should go and dress as his cameos. I actually, <laughs> that, I did. I was intrigued, uh, Michael. So I did Google Shamoween and uh, saw some of the backstage. Because, of course, they have like the uh, whatever, the, the picture wall, you know, where you go and it's got all the logos on it. And he showed up and he was in costumes as like the Terminator and Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, characters and stuff like that. So, yeah. Grant Parrish says about 15 minutes into the movie, I made a joke about what if, and it was the twist to the movie. I promise to only use my Oracle powers for good and personal gain. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Nick Capriola said, I didn't know you guys watch hot garbage. This movie was the final nail in Um, my hope for Shyamalan movies. What's that? I said he clearly didn't watch our offerings episode yet. Hot Amen. garbage is what we do, Nick. That's a, oh, that was lukewarm garbage. Uh, <laughs> C.J. Lewis said uh, Shyamalan peaked at six cents for me. I saw The Village once. I think I'm okay if I didn't ever see it again. Uh, Neil Gum says Shyamalan ding dong. Well, it's better than The Happening. True. That might be a true statement. Uh, at least The Happening's are rated So? So you get some gory stuff. Yeah, you don't get in any minute, other Shyamalan movie. And a five-minute conversation about hot dogs. Anybody else remember that I, movie? I know. <laughs> okay, but at least it crosses into... Yeah, because they refer to hot dogs as a cold one, which is disgusting. <laughs> but <laughs> at least that movie crosses into, like, awesomely bad territory, right? Did you guys hear about the bees? I can't even do the... Uh, 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 well, Stay tuned. I, I, I we'll can't. I, I, will t- I will turn into a cringe. <laughs> uh, Giant cringe. Well, Peter Gatt said about he the was... Bees? Yeah, I don't know. We're going to nail it uh, probably off air. <laughs> Peter Gatt said he was never on the M. Night Shanana wagon. Shanana. M. Night Shanana wagon. There you go. I did it better. About last week's episode, we watched a movie called Offerings. Gary Macon said the only good thing about this movie was the bend over joke. 
That was the Sean great agreed. thing about that movie. That was the high point. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that movie was chosen by Sean uh, uh, and the recommendation of a friend of his, Novato Judoka, says, Sean, who is your friend and why does he hate you? F this movie in the A. He does yeah. have he does yeah. have a bad taste in movies. Like we agree on some things, but he's got a bad taste in movies. Hopefully he's listening to this. Episode. I hope so. David, you have bad taste in movies most of the time. About the previous week's episode, which was Zoltan Hound of Dracula, Tired Silver wrote in and says, I think I may pass on Zoltan, but if you had said that it had Chinese hopping vampire dogs in it. I'd be all in. When do the listeners get to pick the movies you watch? I've got some zingers. Well, oh. Holly, tell us when the listeners will be able. Well, we are we are always taking recommendations, and uh, we we do we do take those to heart as we add them to our list. However, January is dedicated listener choice month, and this January you will be able to sum- actually in December you'll be able to submit your uh, your recommendations and vote on them, and we will watch four. Listener choices in the month of January. And we'll put those on our Facebook page. So you got to follow along there, which is Michaela. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. There you go. What about Zoltan? Did, <laughs> did we just did we just start the social media thing and then 20 minutes later get to the Facebook? No, we did it before. It? No, we, no, we did it the first time, but Colin oh. just did a callback. Yeah. Because this is where you can I, yeah, find I the... We, yeah. I thought we didn't get to it, and then we just no. had gone that whole thing. Because well that was pretty brilliant. Out. Not that well planned out. Uh, oh, man. Well, you guys thing. need to go. You guys need to learn to improv better and just go with it. And so we make us look like the <laughs> Uh Well, about Zoltan, Bill Hainer writes in and said, uh, you guys are so right. This movie is so worth it. My wife was sold on that radio ad for Dracula's dog. What an odd advertising campaign. We're watching it now. My wife recognized the exterior of Dracula's tomb as the old bear habitat at the L.A. Zoo in Griffith Park. You can see that railing blocking it off. Well, we missed the rail. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I like that Bill went out Love and had it. to buy the Blu-ray, you know, to, for Zoltan uh, How to Dracula <laughs> based on our recommendation. Well, you won't be disappointed. We all recommended it. That was a uh, freak show approved. Uh, El Scorcho 86 says, I was looking for this movie that scared the hell out of me when I was young. There was like a dog biting someone's head off. I wonder if this was the movie I've been searching for all these years. I doubt it. Yeah, I don't remember anybody's head getting bit off. Right. No. You might I mean, want to try. The one got chewed up a bit, but he didn't get his head bit off. Yeah, maybe. I haven't seen Devil Dog How to Hell, but you can see a guy biting a or a dog biting somebody's head off in uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Suspiria could be that. Bill, movie. if you do find it, please let us know. And Carson Snar says, uh, "I thought Zoltan was the creepy animatronic fortune teller from Big." I did too. <laughs> no, no Z- Zoltan's the cult leader from Dude Where's My Car. Zoltan. Did you know that Zoltan, I don't know if it's an anglization of uh, Sultan, right? There you go. It's in Arabic. Sultan. Was, the, was the, the fortune teller machine Zoltar in big? Yes. You might be right. I think it was Zoltar. Yeah. It was Zoltar. Was it? There you go. I think so. That's why you listen to the Saturday Night Freak Show. You're going to get educated about this kind of thing. Now, we are going to tell you what you what we think about tonight's movie, The Village. We're going to go around the table. We're going to start with... Sean! <laughs> okay. So, The Village. Um, wow. Thanks, Holly. I had a far higher opinion of this movie before having to watch it again tonight. Um... <laughs> Oh, that's a tough one. I do like this is this is the end of until we got to split. This was the end of my love for Shyamalan. Um, I think uh, everything before this is was pretty damn good. Signs is still my favorite movie of his. Um, I think that movie is um, for me. Um, I think it's pretty perfect. Now, I know other people don't have that opinion, but I think it's pretty great. Plus, I love like. Give me that alien movie. Like, if anyone knows me, they know I'm waiting for the day when the aliens finally come down to Earth and just start taking us all away. So, alien movies. I mean, we uh, got a couple months left to 2020, so. I know. So, hopefully, we're going to fit it in there. Um, so, that was kind of peak for me. Um, Unbreakable is good. This one, I, I liked a lot. 
more after I, you know, earlier on when I first saw it, I, I heard a lot of people complaining about it. And I thought it was, I thought it was pretty much right in line with the stuff he does. Um, and I really liked it when it came out. I, I, um, uh, going through it tonight though, man, I was fine with this movie being in my own head. Um, and then it got discussed, uh, openly and out loud. And there are a lot more problems with it. I that I see now. Um, but damn, there's some good stuff in this movie. Um, I think it's Shyamalan is a, I think a very good director. I think he does great stuff with his characters. I think this movie is shot great. I mean, it's Deacons. I think this movie looks beautiful. Um, there's some good stuff in this movie, some good moments, even though it does get overwrought, like in the middle of it. And I mean, the disappointment of not having monsters, come on. I was really looking forward to that. Um, but I don't know. I still think I'm going to recommend this movie. It's got problems, but there's enough there that I'll watch it again. I like watching the story. It's Joaquin Phoenix and Bryce Dallas Howard for me. I like their relationship through this, and I still think there's some good moments in this. It still does it for me. I recognize more problems now than I did back then, but I'm still going to recommend it. I still like this movie. Um, I saw Michaela shaking her head, so she's next. Michaela, what did you think? <laughs> I just can't Shyamalan's believe you re- recommended it after you agreed with so much of what we said. Is it's wrong. got problems, but there's it's just that emotion, the emotional level. On, I mean, the intelligence has gone right out the window as far as I don't right. connect with this movie on an emotional level at all. No, like I, I feel nothing watching their love story. It does, it just there, there's nothing to this movie for me. Um, I, I didn't like the movie the first time I saw it. Um, and I definitely still don't like it after watching it tonight. I I feel like with Shyamalan, this movie really is like that car is on the edge of the cliff and like the two front wheels are about to go over. Like that's right this point of his career because it is nothing but terribleness after this until we get to split, which is 12 years after this. So um, it's like this definitely feels like it was made in a vacuum or just like he had no studio intervention or something because he, he either thinks we're all really stupid or he thinks it doesn't matter. And it just, it feels careless. It feels sloppy. It feels like I have this one thing I want to do. I'm going to do it, whether it works or not. And that's his like fatal flaw is just being so sticking to whatever is important to him and not necessarily what makes a good movie. And this movie just doesn't have enough redeeming qualities to make it worth watching. I don't care that it was shot by Roger Deakins being pretty does not make a movie worth watching. Um, it's, it's got a great cast and great cinematography that are wasted on a plot that is so thin, but stretched to almost two hours for some reason. Um, this, yeah, there's no reason to watch this movie. It's been around for so long. You either know that everyone knows the twist by now, and it really has no rewatch value because of that twist. So definitely hard pass on the village. Colin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I got to agree pretty much with everything that you said. The, uh, um, I mean, I do think that, you know, <clears throat> you know, as I was saying before, he's a really good director uh, of people. Uh, he's, uh, you know, marshaled great technicians, uh, you know, so they make a really good looking movie. It flows well. It's edited. Well, the performances are on point. I mean, everybody in this movie has nothing to be ashamed of. It's like they do great work. Uh, his writing of characters, I think is really good, but the problem is, you know, and you know, we said this before it's once you, uh, you know, realize what's going on here then it's almost like the movie evaporates and it's like M night Shyamalan is sitting in front of you. You know, it's like you lose the movie. There's just this guy. You can't say anything to him and he's not even aware that you're there, but he's sitting there going like, look, you know, like, you know, and it's just, uh, I, I can't get past it. It's like, it ruins the movie. He, he destroys a movie. Uh, so he can sit there and go like, look at how I'm pulling the strings and you know, you're just going to be blindly following following me into all these uh areas and uh you know yeah i think he's i think he thinks you're stupid um 
which is uh yeah i i can't get past that i i, I think that uh i'm gonna have to you know despite all the things that i would say you know technically where this movie is impeccable uh it's built on a foundation which is rotten you know and so they're all in service ultimately of um it's a waste you know um yeah, so man, uh, even though it has good moments and even though it has uh, uh, good, uh, you know, good writing, good performances, all that, I think uh, you got to skip the village because it's just uh, it's a bummer. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think more than anything else, it's just you you just feel kind of let down, disappointed, and like, well, what the fuck did I just waste all my time for? So uh, yeah, I would um, I, I'm I'm gonna skip on. Yeah, I think you should skip the village. Holly, bring us home the village it's your secret favorite m night Shyamalan movie isn't it well i think you all make some very good points and i i definitely agree with you um there is a lot to be desired with this movie however i do agree with sean that there are a lot of things to to enjoy about this movie um you know colin you were saying that like you know despite the fact that there's well-written characters and despite the fact that it's shot beautifully, like it's not a great movie. I was like, I kind of have the opposite perspective. It's like, despite the fact that there's some stuff that really pisses me off about this movie, I do really like the characters. There are some moments that I really enjoy. I, Sean was talking about the scene on the porch between Joaquin Phoenix and, and uh, Bryce Dallas Howard. I love that scene. You know, it, it's, it has stayed with me over the years. There's something about that dialogue back and forth that is just beautiful to me. And I, I, I think it's lovely. And, um, you know, there's, we talk about the, we talk about the twist and how we can see it coming. I remember watching this for the first time. And the moment that Adrian Brody stabs Joaquin Phoenix and we realized that he was stabbed, that was my twist. I was like, holy shit. I didn't see that one coming. Like I, I saw the, the rest of it coming. Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. Yeah. That, was like holy shit and actually i i'd be re- I, I hate to interrupt you i'd be remiss to not yeah. mention i don't know if anybody if everyone knows this um this movie was what pg-13 i was just gonna bring this up oh okay well you so, go ahead it was supposed to be rated r based on the sound effect of him getting stabbed but then they watched it and realized that it's more effective without the sound effect so they took it out yeah they it got rated r because it had that sound effect in yes. there and then they took it out got the PG-13, and then obviously it ended up working much better afterwards. Yeah, and I, I love that scene. That was my twist. You know, everyone else talks about the, the rest of the movie, but that was my big moment that I did not see coming. So there are mo- there are parts in this that I, I think work really well. And, you know, I agree that it's, it's, it's a hard rewatch when we know the twists at the end. However, rewatching it and seeing Adrian Brody's reactions throughout the movie... That's an interesting aspect to me because I remember watching this and being really creeped out by him laughing, but then watching it again and realizing why he's reacting that way. It's so much more interesting to me. So that rewatch aspect is something that I think is a positive. Um, that might be the only positive for rewatch, if, unless you have these scenes that really speak to you, you know, like the porch scene and, and, and whatnot. Um, but I do agree. It is hard to rewatch once you know the ending. It just is. Um, but there's enough there for me that I still enjoy parts of it. Um, the village is definitely not my favorite Shyamalan movie. Sean, I, I think it might be signs. I might agree with you there. Uh, six cents is a close second. I'm not sure they're kind of neck and neck and I, I love split, but, um, I think I'm still going to recommend this. It still gives me those fall vibes and there's still some stuff that I really enjoy about it. So it has its major problems and things that make me borderline angry but i kind of like that it does that i kind of like that i have those reactions i don't know so i think i'm gonna recommend it i'm going right. with it so we're evenly split on yes. the village <laughs> all right it did i'm sorry did we say that judy greer was also on the saturday night free show wall of fame is she i'm surprised oh, it took her this long okay i'm sorry i thought yeah, we talked about her before in. yeah oh, so she was Halloween. in the village Halloween and cursed. cursed, cursed. There you cursed. go. Ah, so right. Welcome to the world. Where, 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 where. <laughs> That's right. We talked about Judy deacons. Judy but Greer I, I should forgot. be on yeah. every wall of fame at this point. I think. Well, there you go. She's pretty much in everything. And fun fact: Her and Bryce Dallas Howard played sisters again in Jurassic World. 
Boom. It's very true. And yeah, during that oh, whole shit, that's awesome right. divorce angle. Yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, there Jesus. you go. All right. So um oh, he sucks. Oh yeah, sucks Jurassic lot. World? The first Jurassic one World yeah. sucks. I like it Jurassic sucks World. So I hated Colin. the second one, but I did like the first they one. They both suck. <laughs> so sorry. Fighting words. All right. So next week Colin we're gonna Jafar watch a movie second. that's chosen by Michaela. <laughs> Michaela, what are we going to watch I next week? <laughs> yes, I thought so. What are we going to watch next week? Uh, we're going to watch something that I am shocked has never been brought to the freak show. You guys want a monster movie, so I'm giving you one. We're going to watch Pumpkinhead from 1988. Ooh. Yes. Right, we're definitely in the Halloween season here. Oh, so. yes. All right. Michaela, that was going to be my October pick. Yeah. I had right. it on the. I was like, if somebody else isn't going to pick this. All right. Well, there you go. Nice. So thanks oh, yeah, for we're getting that one out. For... You first October pick? Is that yeah. think, where we're at? No, okay. I think nice. uh, this episode's in October. So Does this come out? Yep. So is, are we in October? I think we're what in October. Time? Yeah. What, what is time? time? It's 2020. What? I guess it will be. I guess, I guess so. I guess it will be. Yeah. This is so the October right. pick. We're, we're clocking it down to yeah. Halloween. It's all right. October pick. We're going We're going deep Halloween with uh, Pumpkinhead next yeah. week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.